Okay, so I'm going to start by uh, reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark. We're still in our Mark month, where we've been laying particular emphasis on the Gospel of Mark and just finding out all about that particular Gospel. And so I'm going to start off in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 14. Want to follow me? Uh, Mark 14, and starting at verse 12, I'm going to read quite a lengthy kind of portion just to put it all in context for you. Verse 12, And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare, that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house. The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared and made ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he come with the twelve, and as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, uh, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful, and say unto him, uh, One by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is the one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The son of a man indeed goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. And as they did eat, Jesus took the bread and blessed and brake it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it and he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Okay, so that's what the, the Gospel of Mark says about uh, communion, that it comes out of the Passover uh, feast that the, the Hebrews used to have. And uh, they were meeting together to celebrate the Passover. And at the end of the Passover feast, it was eaten as a meal, as, as a lot of you all know, the end of it they would break the bread and they would uh, share that amongst themselves the master of the house would, would stand up and he'd break that bread and, and that was all just sort of part of the passover feast but what happens now is uh, that jesus brings this new uh, kind of ordinance from it he, he, he does something uh, surprising doesn't he? he he takes the bread and he blesses it and breaks it and says this is my body imagine uh, the surprise in his disciples when, when he says that this is, this is my body that's broken for you. We can bring in other gospels as well to sort of uh, to fill it out. In Mark 14, 22 it says take eat. In Matthew 26, 27 it says uh, uh, he, he took the cup and gave thanks and said drink ye all of it. And uh, in Luke 22 verse 19 he says this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So Jesus is saying, look, this is all about me. Uh, why is that important? Because the Passover, the teaching of the Passover, you remember what happened was that the, the children of Israel were told to put that blood on the doorposts and the lintels and that the destroyer, the angel of death, would pass over them and they would be safe. And they were to take a lamb and kill that lamb. Uh, and that, that was the blood that they were to use. And Jesus is making a reference to himself saying, I am the Lamb of God. Remember when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, referring to Jesus. So he's making this very, very tangible connection between the Passover and what we now call communion. I mean, all different phrases that we use on the breaking of bread, the Lord's table. Now I'm going to use the word communion just because it's shorter. Uh, today and also it's a, it's a word that you'll find in the Bible and so so this is what we now call communion just worth saying communion isn't, isn't the Passover there is a difference you know it comes out of the Passover uh, feast but it's slightly different you know they wouldn't normally do that in the Passover feast but Jesus establishes this new 
ordinance. And I want to say right from the beginning that it's a command. Jesus commands us to take it. I'll just, uh, uh, we, we read the verses there, but I've just jotted them down in a simple form for you here. He says, Take, eat, drink ye, this do. So you've got always a reference to these two things, the bread, which is a remembrance of his body, and the wine or the cup, which is a remembrance of his blood. And Jesus is saying, take, eat, drink ye, this do. So we have a commandment here from the Lord. And you might think, well, well that's all very clear. I thought you said it was going to be really you know, difficult, hard to understand. But then it gets more difficult. Why? Well, because there is a lot of historical baggage, if you like, surrounding the Lord's table. I'll explain to you what I mean. Um, if you go back to, say, the time of the, the 1500s or the 1400s in Europe, uh, nobody zone out on me here because it's important, okay, the Roman Catholic Church ruled the whole of Europe. I mean, it's hard for us to understand how powerful they really were. But the Pope uh, was, was just like the head of this enormous organization. It was just so powerful. Uh, they were the only visible church um, in, in Europe at that particular time. I think I'm right in saying, uh, you know, and he was just this incredible, powerful head. So much so that uh, monarchs had to kind of grovel before him and, and kiss his feet. I mean, that was the power that the Pope had. And the, the Roman Catholic Church was was all powerful and it ruled people's lives. And you might say, well, well, what if you just disagreed with what they said? Couldn't you just say, well, that's your opinion, but I'm gonna, I've got my own opinion about that particular uh, doctrine. So, but you couldn't do that because if you oppose the Pope, you could run the risk of being excommunicated. And again, you might say, well, better out than in. But it, it, it was a really serious thing. If you got excommunicated, it meant that nobody would be able to sell to you. You couldn't sell to anybody else. So you became a virtual beggar. It was like the mark of Cain. Uh, you really were an outcast from your society. And so people were absolutely terrified of doing anything that was against the Pope or against the Roman uh, Catholic Church. So they just had to do as they were told. And also, they didn't have the Bible in English. So you couldn't say, hang on, this doesn't seem quite right to me. I'm just going to have a little look now and see what the Bible said. Because it's all in Latin. You know, most people, their understanding of Jesus Christ was from the stained glass windows and things like that. You, know, you see some depictions of something happening in the Bible. You know, you learn something. Or the priest might, you know, might have a word with the priest. He might tell you something. But most of the services, all the services conducted in Latin anyway. So you don't even understand from the priest what's going on. But then, something happened in, I think it was about 1517, uh, a German monk called Martin Luther reading through his, uh, his Bible, and he comes to a sudden revelation, a sort of eureka moment, where he realizes, hang on, it's by faith that we're saved. Now, you might think, oh, it's obvious, isn't it? But this was a real turning point in the whole history of the church and Christianity in Europe. Some people realize, we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved, we're not saved by doing good works, by you know, doing all these things and, and by giving money to the church, that was the same as it's through faith that we get all these great phrases coming out like uh, uh, sola fide, faith alone, sola scriptura, you might have heard of some of these, by the scripture or by the word alone. And so people say, yeah, it's by faith in Jesus we're saved. And the Bible, that's the word of God. And so there was a new emphasis on the word of God. It's all come relevant in a minute. The new emphasis on the Word of God, people said, wow, we can find out what God's will is for us by looking at His, His Word, by having it in our own language. And Martin Luther started to translate portions of the Bible into German in his own language. And so you've got people in England saying, well, he's doing it. Maybe some of the academics that we've got, maybe some of the scholars there at the universities, they could produce for us something like that. And so that's what started to happen. And, and just here and there, you've got uh, English Bibles started to appear. John Wycliffe had done it in the 14th century before, but that was out of the Saxon, uh, sorry, that was out of the Latin into the Saxon, so not, not quite the same thing. But now they were going back to the Greek and the Hebrew, getting really 
uh, more and more accurate translations. So you've got things like the Bishop's Bible, uh, the Geneva Bible, and so on, and then uh, Tyndale's translation, and then it culminates in the King James Bible, which we've got here, you know, and, and people had the Bible, the Word of God, in a language that they could read, and it was like a stick of dynamite, it really was. It's like throwing a stick of dynamite into the church, it just exploded, and it took away all that dominating power that the Roman Catholic Church had, and now Christians themselves had a power that they hadn't had, they could put, they had this, the Word of God, and they said, wow, this is going to be my final authority in matters of faith and practice. I don't need to ask the priest anymore, what should I do? I need to go to the Word of God and read it, and it will tell me what I need to do. And so we started a reforming process in the church, the Reformation, so it means. And that was great, it was, it was a superb, wonderful thing. But the problem was, the Reformation did not go far enough. There were still things that were left over from the Church of Rome, and they found their way into the Protestant Church. You know, a lot of people don't realise that, but lot, lots of things changed, but not everything changed. We still carried some of it uh, with us. And I want to kind of explain it maybe like this, just to give you a, a pictorial sort of illustration. Imagine two trees growing together, and you, you, know, you plant a tree very close to another one, and as the branches start to grow, they kind of entwine one with another, and then you might look at those trees and think, well, you know, I, I really struggle to tell whether that branch was coming from this tree or whether it's coming from this tree. And it's a bit like that with some of the doctrines that churches hold today, particularly surrounding communion, is you, know, you look at these various rules and, uh, and uh, uh, doctrines surrounding them, and you might think, yeah, I think that's probably, that, that's, that's Christian doctrine, isn't it? That's, it's a rule in the Bible, isn't it? But then you've got to start at the end of that branch and you've got to trace it back. And you might be surprised to think, oh, actually, it doesn't go. It doesn't go to the Bible. It goes to the tradition of men. And so you've got to separate the one from the other. And sometimes it's quite a difficult job um, being able to do that. But I want to do that this morning. I want to stick to the Bible, what the Bible teaches. Um, you know, I don't think there's a denomination in, in the world today that hasn't carried something from pre-Reformation days, even though they probably like to think they haven't, because it's just been instilled in our culture, in our society, and so on, and you know, whether you're Methodist, or Presbyterian, or Baptist, uh, anything that's coming out of the Church of England, because remember, the Church of England this year was a Catholic church, and then it became a Protestant church, they've brought with them something of the doctrine of the Mass surrounding Communion. And if you go to a real high church, Church of England, uh, you'll see a great deal of similarity. You know, the vestments and the liturgy and so on. It really is very similar to Roman Catholic Church. Um, but even you know, since we've got XJWs here, even something like the the Kingdom Hall Memorial, you know, there is something ritualistic about it, isn't it? Even though they would like to say that they're nothing to do with that. You know, everybody's there, best clothes on and everything, aren't they? And there's this ritual of the passing of the cup and so on. So, so there is something that we inherit. What we've got to do is kind of try and divest ourselves of that baggage and just say, well, what does the Bible teach? A quote here from, um, from uh, John Wesley. I, I do like this quote. And there's a bit of humor in here as well, I think. He says, uh, my ground is the Bible. Yea, I am a Bible bigot, he says, because I follow it in all things, both great and small. And that's the kind of bigotry that I'm, I've been called a bigot a few times, but, but that's the kind of bigotry I'm comfortable with. Yet I do follow the Bible. I do follow the scriptures in all matters, great and small. And that's what I want to do this morning is follow the Bible. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says that you might learn uh, in us not to think of men above that which is written. So we don't think of the traditions of men above that which is written, but rather we take the Bible as our final authority in all these, in all these matters. So, we have a commandment. Take, eat, drink ye, this do. It's a threefold um, commandment. And Jesus in uh, Mark 14, 22 says that strange thing. 
this is my body. <coughs> and in Mark 14, 24, he says, uh, this is my blood, pointing to uh, these objects, the bread and the wine. And this has led to some very strange ideas. <coughs> People take it literally and say, oh, well, he means that the bread is actually his body, that it changes into his body. We have this, this doctrine of transubstantiation. The Roman Catholic Church holds it, the Greek Orthodox Church holds it. I don't know if there are any other denominations that do hold it. But the question is, is Jesus talking literally when he says that? Uh, now in Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus says, this cup is the New Testament. Is that, is that literal? Is, is the cup itself, if you looked in the cup, I'm not trying to be facetious, but you look in the cup and you, are there words in there? The words of the New Testament? Some translations say, this cup is the new covenant. You have to get into the new covenant. Do you have to climb into a cup? No, it's, we, we understand it's not a literal uh, meaning that Jesus is putting on that. He's saying, this is a remembrance of those things. When you take it, when you eat it, and when you drink the cup, you are remembering my body and my blood. That's the significance of it. We're not into sort of hyper-literalism surrounding this because, you know, our reason shows that that, that can't work. That's not logical. Um, it really isn't. Turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 14, just again putting it in context for you if I can. Uh, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not uh, the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So, there is a mystery that surrounds uh, the breaking of bread, um, a communion in, in, in which some sense we actually become partakers um, of Christ. In verse 17 he says, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Jesus again is using these terms figuratively, isn't he? We, we, you know, we talk about, we sang that hymn, about uh, manna coming down, and Jesus himself uh, talks about himself as uh, that bread of life in John 6, 48, that bread which came down from heaven. Um, so there is a figurative sense in which when we, we share the breaking of bread, and you, you, you drink that cup and you, you eat that bread, we know we're not just eating food, don't we? We know we're not just, uh, oh, I'm glad I've got something to eat, a little bit hungry, we know it's something special. We know that we're observing something that is a remembrance of Jesus Christ and that we become partakers of Christ. Not because we're putting bread into our mouth or because we're drinking wine, but because by faith we become partakers of Christ. And uh, Jesus himself says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And, uh, you know, this, verses like this led to the time when the early church started. The Roman authorities thought there was some really weird, awful sect that were actually uh, uh, espousing cannibalism or something. You know, it's, it's, you've got to eat his body and, and this sort of thing. And so that was one of the reasons they were persecuted. They thought this is some really strange, dodgy sect. Um, they didn't realize that there's a, there's a, the way that Jesus is speaking, he's saying, look, you've got to feed on me by faith. I have got to be the thing that gives you life. Just as, you know, during the week, you've got to eat food, you've got to uh, eat bread and meat and so on to stay uh, healthy, and to stay alive. You suddenly stopped eating, you never ate again, you know, you would die. Jesus says, in the same way, you've got to feed on me spiritually. You've got to feed on me. Uh, I have got to be your sustenance in your spiritual life. You've got to come and pray to me. You've got to come and meditate upon my word. You've got to be found in me. You know, that's what he means by feeding on him. Spending time in his presence. And uh, anybody will know that 
if you're a Christian, if you backslide, if you come away from the Lord and you stop feeding on Christ, if you stop spending time in his presence, praying to him, studying his word, you become spiritually very weak. You know, and uh, uh, it really does affect you. Whereas the, the more time you're spending in the presence of God, when you're reading your Bible every day, praying every day, there's a joy and a health that fills your life. That's what certainly I found that an energy and a peace and, and a happiness in Christ. And so that's what he's talking about. And when we take communion, when we have this remembrance, there is some way in which we become spiritually partakers of Christ. Uh, uh, is he is present in some way in that. It's a mystery, but, but, but he is present when we take it, we share that communion with one another, we are also communing with Christ. So let's just backtrack a little bit. So we have a remembrance of Christ, not a ritual. Now, somebody once said to me, oh, well, it's the only ritual that Christ has given. But it isn't a ritual. God doesn't say it's a, you can turn it into a ritual if you want to. But it is just a remembrance. You can get together with your, 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 your friends and have a time of prayer together and you can break bread. You don't have to have the priest or the vicar or whoever there administering it to you. You can just take it amongst yourselves if you do it in the right spirit. You know, you can share it amongst yourselves and have that time of communion. In fact, I think it was the, the early Methodist church that used to take it every time they met, breaking their bread, every single time. Uh, because because it, God commands it. Christ has commanded it. Do this. Take, eat, drink ye. This do. It's a commandment. Okay. That was my second point. It's a commandment. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's important to establish that. Let's be obedient to Christ's commandments then. The third point is this, it is a means of partaking of the blessings of Christ. Somehow we are partaking of the blessings of Christ when we share this, this meal. Alright, let's look at some points of, um, of disagreement. Uh, I've been saying all along, this is a commandment of Christ. Is there anyone who is exempt from obeying Christ's commandment? Are there those who, you know, you don't, you don't have to take it? It's okay. Ignore Christ's commandment. Well, some people say, well, unless you're a member of this church, you are not taking breaking of bread. What, what branch is that from then? Let's try and trace that through to our tr relative tree. I don't see it in the Bible. It's the Lord's table. Uh, he is offering it, uh, not your church. So I just don't see how, how you could make that a Bible doctrine, what people do. There you go. Um, you've got to be confirmed, otherwise you can't take it. Again, stick that one in the bin with, with, with the first one. I, I just don't see that in the Bible. You know. Um, okay, let's get on to more more uh, issues that, shall we say, are, are heatedly discussed amongst Christians. What about children? Should children be allowed to take uh, breaking of bread? And, uh, and drink the wine. Well, here's some arguments why they shouldn't. Um, they might not understand the doctrinal significance of it. Um, does that mean that we don't want our children to obey any of God's commandments unless they first understand the doctrinal significance of it? Uh, we want them to obey the commandments of God, don't we? We want them to obey Christ's commandments. Um, do we want them to partake of his blessings? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, Mark 10, verse 4, Jesus says, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. The disciples were there, you remember? Uh, go on, you kids, off you go, go away. This is, this is really important stuff we're doing here. You don't have a lot of children hanging around. Sometimes in churches we can be a little bit like the disciples, can't we? We say, well, we're trying to get on with something important here. We don't want a lot of children hanging around. But Jesus said, no, suffer the little children to come unto me. Forbid them not. Let them come to me. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 7 says, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. The commandments of God. Teach them to your children. Teach them to obey them, whether they are regenerate or not. Teach them to obey the commandments of God. Teach them to obey the commandments of Christ. 
Paul describes the law, the law uh, as the commandments of God, as our schoolmaster. He says it was our schoolmaster, how fitting, to bring us onto Christ. Galatians 3, 24. He says it brought us to Christ. When we didn't know, we didn't understand really what God wanted, the law brought us to Christ. And in the same way, you know, the law and even the breaking of bread can bring children to Christ. And you can say, well, I, I've never heard that before. I've never heard anyone teach that it's okay for children to take it. Well, where is that rule coming from? Where can you trace it back to? Can you trace it back to the Bible? Is it your final authority in matters of faith and practice? As many people say that it is. Then we've got to say, well, well where is that coming from? Now, um, I believe in, these things are, in many ways, matters of conscience. You know, I, I'm not about to have people ordering me around and telling me whether I should uh, let my children take communion or not. And therefore, I'm not going to be presumptuous enough to tell others, you must let your children take communion. But I'd just like people to, to take these things on board and to consider them and to go and do uh, their own study if necessary. Okay, what about others taking communion? What about the unsaved taking communion? You know, uh, most churches that I've been in would say no. no. In fact, I've been in churches, they'll say something like, and they're all sort of similar, they'll say, right, we're going to break bread now. If you don't know the Lord, if you're, if you're not a Christian, just let the emblems pass you by and uh, wait until you know the Lord and it will mean so much more to you. Again, where does that come from? Is this in the Bible? Uh, some, some of you will be going, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Why doesn't he go? Why doesn't he go to 1 Corinthians 11? Well, I'm going to go with that, but just, just, just not yet. Just bear with me a second. <coughs> Let's understand the significance, first of all, of the breaking of bread. As Jesus said, take heat, this is my body broken for you. Takes the wine as he said, this is my blood. What is that? That's, that's the preaching of the cross, isn't it? That's, that's the gospel in a tangible form. This is my body broken for you. If, you're, if you were sitting here today and you were unsaved and someone said, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Jesus shed for you. You're hearing the gospel. You're hearing the preaching of, of Christ crucified. Therefore, don't dismiss it and say, oh, it's not for the unsaved. You know, in fact, you, you might as well go out. So in some churches, you're not even allowed in. A, if you're not a member of the church, but also if, you, if they know you're not saved, if you say, yeah, no, I'm not a Christian, you won't get through the door. But again, where does that come from? Is it coming from here or is it coming from somewhere else? Let's just do another little bit of history for you. Um, when the Roman Catholic Church was holding Mass and so on, and then they, they ruled the whole of Europe, um, they brought out uh, what they call the sacraments, right? You've heard that phrase? This is one of the, the sacraments, as they called it. Another sacrament was penance, right? Uh, penance breaks down like this. Um, you have number one, contrition, heartfelt sorrow. You have confession, that's to a priest. You have satisfaction, that is, you, you have to do an act of reparation, you know, maybe, maybe fasting, maybe giving alms to the poor, something like that. Uh, and then the fourth was absolution, the priest would absolve you of your sins. Um, and most of that comes from the teaching of Thomas Aquinas, you heard of him? Um, and so you, you, you were said to have done penance. Penance was a condition for you taking communion. You couldn't take it unless you'd done penance. And so here you have a condition whereby you're, you're exempt from the commandment of Christ. Although he says, take, eat, drink, do this, you don't have to do it unless you've done penance, unless you've been through that particular sacrament. People argue and say, well, it's irrelevant to an unsaved person. You know, the breaking of bread and the wine, what relevance is that to a saved person? Why would they want to do it? 
Let me give you three testimonies this morning around communion, around the idea of communion. I spoke to a lady uh, a few years ago, and um, she was a nominal Christian. You know, she went to church. Uh, she may have been brought up as a Christian, I can't quite remember. But she said that her son was asking her, why do we break bread, why do we take this, this communion? And so she was explaining to her son the significance of the bread and the wine and why we do it. Uh, that the bread is to remember the broken body of the Lord, the wine is a remembrance of his blood. And as she was explaining it to him, she came under conviction of the Holy Spirit. She came under conviction and she realised that actually she wasn't a Christian. And at that moment, she repented in her heart and she was born again. All surrounding communion, all surrounding this that we're going to do today. It brought a conviction upon her and she suddenly thought, yeah, I, I want that. I want Jesus Christ. I realise what he's done for me. Uh, my second testimony is a little bit closer to home. Um, in fact, I'm going to drop it on the individual now, if he doesn't mind. Matthew, would you mind just coming out and just no. say a few words? Um, Matthew, as you know, XJW, uh, <coughs> one, one of the things that, that people do when they leave the Watchtower, it seems to be one of the things that a lot of them do, is because in the Watchtower you are not allowed unless you're one of 144,000, you're not allowed to drink of the wine and take of the bread, they just pass it one to the other. It's a strange ceremony, but they just pass it on, nobody takes of it. And so one of the first things people do when they come out of the watchtower, if they still have a belief in God, is often they will break bread. Either they'll go to a church and, and, and do it, the communion service, or they'll go and just do it privately by themselves. So Matthew, you did that. Can you tell us something of the significance for you and what... Uh, 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 you know, what happened when you when, when you did that? Right. Yeah, I expected. <laughs> um, well, my memory is that um, I went to the, the memorial, they call it, for Jehovah's Witnesses, I went to the memorial, and obviously it seemed farcical to me that we should be passing the bread and the wine. So I prepared my own uh, that evening, and that I would do it myself at home. Um, but I was very nervous about this because 1 Corinthians 11 does talk about partaking or eating unworthily. So um, I just remember having the emblems before me and very, very nervously thinking, well, is this the right thing to do? Because uh, only they say 144,000 go to heaven. Uh, so what I did was I prayed, Lord, show me if it's right. And I asked that I would open my Bible and he showed me for certain whether or not this, sh this, this should be also something I sh should uh, partake of. And as I finished the prayer and opened my Bible, sure enough it fell to John chapter 6, which says, unless anyone eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, he has no part in me. You know, it's, we have to partake to receive eternal life. So I thought that was a sign. I did it. And that's when I got saved, when I was born again. It was after that that I had this overwhelming sense of uh, Jesus living in me. This sense of God had come down out of heaven and was now in here. It's a very unusual experience. Um, it's almost impossible to describe, but the light seemed to go on, and I knew that I'd been forgiven. And uh, this happened not as a believer, but prior to belief. It was after having partaken that I knew that uh, Christ was risen. Yeah, thank, thanks, man. Yes, thank you very much. Um, sorry for dropping it on you, but, but you, you hear what Matthew's saying there. Um, he was unsaved when he took that communion, but it was the significance of it that, that, that stuck with him in his mind. And I just want to add one more testimony um, to that, and it is my own. Um, when I, before I was saved, I went to a church meeting. I was invited there by a, by a young lady. 
and uh, I was sat in the, the, the congregation and they, they started to pass around the bread and, and the wine and so on. And I was really seeking the Lord. I wasn't saved this time, but I really was seeking God. And I wanted to know, is God real? Uh, and if he is real, then I want to know him. I want to, I want to have a relationship with him. <clears throat> and so, as they brought around the, the, the plate with the sort of bread on, uh, they realized that I wasn't uh, a Christian because I didn't go to their church. It was kind of obvious the way that I was dressed. I won't go into that. But, um, but, but as the plate came around, I could see they were going to whip it past me. And so I stuck out my hand and I stopped the plate and I took a bit of bread and ate it. And then uh, they brought the wine round and they must have thought, oh, well, he's had the bread, he might as well have the wine as well. <laughs> so, so I took the wine and I, and I drank that. And, and after that, the, the young lady that I was with turned to me and said, uh, you know, that you're only supposed to take the bread and the wine. Uh, if you're sort of serious about God. And I turned to him and said, well, I am. I am serious about God. And I certainly was. You know, I was serious about finding God. And uh, uh, in the, 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 as the day progressed, I went, went back to her house and we had a meal with her family and so on. And then the evening, I went back to the church and that's when I got saved. That's when I was born again. Right, so just bear this in mind as we, the, the three testimonies that you've heard as we turn to this uh, uh, famous uh, passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, and I'm going to start at verse 17. Verse 17. The Apostle Paul says this, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Okay, so he's coming out, this is something negative that he's going to say. Who's he writing to? A church. The church of Corinth. And he's saying, look, I've got to deal with an issue here that I, I don't praise you for. It's something that you're doing and it's not right. Okay, so that's the context. I'm going to sort of dip backwards and forwards on this passage. It's really important to get this right, I think, in, in our own minds. Okay, so, so come down to verse 23. This is, these are verses you'll often hear at communion. Verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which, I also, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, is what Matthew is talking about, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, at home sorry, that you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come, he says. So, the phrase that, that Paul uses there, uh, is eating and drinking, eating the bread and drinking the cup of the Lord unworthily. Now people say, oh, well, um, you know, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're unsaved, you're eating and drinking unworthily. <coughs> so are we saying that I'm a Christian, therefore I'm worthy, I'm worthy in God's eyes to, to partake of this? None of us is worthy. That might be a surprise to you this morning, but I'm going to let you know, none of us is worthy of the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says God commends his love to us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So none of us is worthy in that sense. 
So it doesn't mean unworthily in the sense that, uh, oh, you weren't worthy of the death of Christ. You weren't, dirt, you weren't worthy of his death. You weren't good enough. It doesn't mean it in that sense. What's the context? Okay, uh, verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry and another is drunken. So what they were doing was they were coming and saying, oh, bread, fantastic. Well, nothing to eat, absolutely starving, grabbing the bread, eating it, and then others were thinking, this wine is just fantastic, knocking the wine back, getting drunk. Paul says, that's, un- that's eating and drinking unworthily. Because he says in verse 29, you're eating and drinking damnation, that is judgment on yourself, not discerning the Lord's body. You haven't discerned that this is something different. This isn't just food. It's not just you're thirsty, have a drink of the, the, of the drink we've got there. You're hungry, eat something there. He says, you haven't discerned. This is about the Lord's body. It's about a sacrifice. This is something special that we're doing. It's an observance. The tangible objects that remind us of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you treat them with respect. That's what Paul's saying. And who's he writing to? Believers, right? The Corinthian church. He's writing to believers, saying, you're eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Does he mention unbelievers? Does he mention uh, non-Christians, the unsaved, whatever word you want to use? Is he mentioning them? Not that I can see. But listen, um, I am happy to concede if you say, oh, well, it applies to everybody. It applies to unsaved people as well as Christians. I will concede that fact. If you will concede that take, eat, drink ye, this do, also applies to everybody. And you don't say, oh no, it's just to the disciples, that. So Christ has commandments, and we should be encouraged and encourage others to obey his commandments. But they ought not to eat and drink unworthily. They ought to have the correct respect and discern that it is the body of the Lord that we are celebrating here. I would not let my children take it, I don't, if they're doing it in a foolish manner. If they're just acting in a silly manner, we say, no, this is, we're remembering the death of Jesus now. And if my children will do that in a sober manner, then I will permit them to take it. And you might say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Well, Show me your branch and show me where it leads. Tell me which tree it leads to. Is it, is it from the commandments of men or is it from the commandments of God? Is it from the word of God? It's very important when we assemble together, particularly around the Lord's table, that we do so in the right um, manner. 1 Timothy 3.15 says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So there's a way in which we need to behave ourselves when we are in the church. What's the church? The people. Right? Not, not when we're in St Andrews, but when we're in an assembled group of believers who've come here to, to partake of the bread and the wine. You have to do it in the right spirit. Otherwise, you're going to eat and drink judgment on yourself. Does it mean you can't eat and drink if you're, if you're unsaved? Is the judgment of God going to come on you? Did the judgment of God come on that the lady that I gave you the testimony of? No, the salvation of the Lord came on her. Because she did it in the right spirit. She understood what it, what it meant. She discerned the body of the Lord. Did the judgment of God come on our brother Matthew there when he broke the bread and he drank the wine? No, the salvation of the Lord came upon him. And the same with, with, with numerous other people who, who can testify to such things. Doing it unworthily does not necessarily mean that you are unsaved at that time. You recognise this is about Jesus. This is about the sacrifice and you do it in the right manner. I believe you're permitted to do it. It's okay for you to do it. And in fact, you might come to know Christ through it. Because there's something of the gospel in it. I'll give you one final illustration. I'm not going to end on this, but just to illustrate why uh, we don't believe that the bread turns into the body. We don't believe that wine turns into blood. So we don't believe that in that sense. It is just bread. It is just wine. We understand that. But I've been in churches where they've, the, the communion services ended and they've got bread left over 
And they said, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not putting this on, there you are, kids, go on, tuck into that. And literally throwing it out, like throwing it at a zoo. And you've got children stuffing their mouths with it, trying to fit as much as they can into their mouths, having a laugh. You know, I think it's really, really dangerous. I really do. And I think it sails very close to Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar took the vessels from, from the temple and abused them, getting drunk with them and so on. The judgment of God came on him. And I think that would come very close to eating and drinking unworthily. Yes, we know it's just bread. But this is a solemn remembrance. You know, dispose of it, get rid of it, but don't don't make a joke of it, don't throw it out. Go on, tuck in. No, this is not just food. That's what Paul's saying, isn't it? It's not just, you don't just eat it because you're hungry. It's a solemn reminder, remembrance of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let, let, let's just have that time now that we normally have, I will pass around the bread uh, um, and, and the wine. Don't feel like it's, you know, you're on ceremony and you can't, you know, if anything might happen that you shouldn't be doing, you're really nervous about it. Just relax, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. We're in obedience to the commandments of the Lord, we're just going to pass it around and share it amongst ourselves. If for any reason, any personal reason you don't want to take of it, that's your business, you know. Um, that's between you and the Lord. But I'm going to take it around now and, um, and we'll, we'll partake of it. And then I'll just extend that time over to